you can ask questions as well. Okay, um, I had this question before yeah. uh, from one of the audience. Uh, it is how network connectivity is addressed in royal government of Bhutan. So I think uh, if I'm not able to answer the whole question, uh, or I have my director will be also assisting here. So in terms of network connectivity, uh, we have two pieces uh, to that: the internal uh, connectivity within the country plus the uh, international uh, connectivity. So in terms of international connectivity, right now we have uh, most of the connections only coming from the uh, from India for redundancy purpose. Uh, we, uh, our department is also uh, in, um, basically, uh, in the process of talking to a government in Bangladesh. Uh, so we will also have an international uh, connectivity from Bangladesh because we understand that they have a huge uh, submarine cable uh, surplus uh, connectivity. And uh, within the uh, uh, national, as I presented uh, uh, in the afternoon, uh, we have a national fiber uh, I mean, uh, uh, fiber network as the backbone for the country. So, um, so yeah. I mean, uh, as I've shown on the as I've shown on the uh, slides from the uh, uh, economic uh, World Economic Forum, in terms of the uh, ICT affordability, we are really doing well. Out of seven, we almost score five point nine, which is close to six. So uh, connectivity is I mean improving a lot. So it's just the services and the other aspects that we sh which we need to become. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any best practices available for maintaining the government department's enterprise architecture? Any suggestions on institutional framework that can be available? I would like to try that. Um, what I have seen is after a certain point, it does help uh, if, the, if the government or any organization for that matter actually uses uh, tools to maintain some of the the both products and uh, architecture models. Uh, it is not to, you know, uh, the idea here is not to you know, choose a specific tool, but the fact that the need for a tool is important because uh, it is potentially uh, possible in government organizations that you might have a core team in the architecture, but it is also possible that you might have an extended team which could be members from the participating ministries who are also contributing to the work. And that is how it gets, uh, uh, I would say, adopted and that, that's how it kind of the footprint of the enterprise architecture expands. It should not be just limited to the core team that is doing. That would be okay at the initial stages, but at some point you need to kind of you know, expand it, and that's how the tool actually gives you a lot of collaborative capabilities. It gives you lots of uh, what if analysis. What, what what happens if I decommission a specific system? What happens if my database uh, standard changes? So all of those connectivity uh, connection view is something that is more easier done in a in a tool rather than trying to do it on Word or PowerPoint or Visio or whatever. It is. Uh, so that is one one way of maintaining. The, the vitality of the enterprise architecture, if you will, uh, it is very important because anything that you do, whether you're doing security, business, technology, data, any of the domains of the perspectives, it is going to change, right? So it's important that the ongoing maintenance of the enterprise architecture itself is one of the critical tasks that is factored into the overall program plan. And tools do help a lot. So, someone else who should not? Absolutely, and what uh, Dr. Swaha said. When we begin, I would share my Indian experience. Uh, when the government of India launched the Panchayat, the mission mode project, so we have in our country 250,000 local bodies, rural local bodies, elected bodies, and they wanted to do an automation. And there are layers, complexities are there, devolution of power is different. So business scenario is quite different and still they wanted to have a workflow systems. And now those business dynamics are changing, always changing. Whosoever political party comes in Karnataka or Uttar Pradesh, they will decide how much power need to be given. We had to do enterprise architecture study. Involving greater involvement was from the domain department, from the various levels. 
because as yesterday was said, it's not a technology exercise. Our experience is a primarily detailed business enterprise study. IT systems should be structured in such a way that they should be able to align. Similarly, in Ministry of Drinking Water and Sanitation, we had a bigger challenge. At least in Panchayat, we were doing ab initio. So even IT or everything was just press. We didn't have, we had challenge to capture the complexity of business process. But in drinking water, we had two operational information system, national information system running, being used. And I could not have gone for disruptive exercise. So involvement of business process, business leaders at various levels and continuation of ongoing systems and slowly aligning. It took time to align. But both were very, uh, both were different aspects and both were. So buying in, but, within, but I must say within the government, as uh, Mr. Sonam was saying, selling it within the government is, is still a challenge and I need to be guided. Uh, it's very difficult to convert the entire thing that this is because of enterprise study, otherwise it would not have been possible. That matrix is not there. <laughs> or if the slight change in the business dynamics would result how much the propagated impact, those business metrics we need to work on. So that I can sell to secretary, the look, government has changed, your priorities have changed, but IT system, your investment on IT systems is more or less leveraged upon and you don't have to make a game. Uh, comment. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Hi. Uh, myself as a Lucian from uh, Infosys as a solution architect. Uh, before uh, asking for the question test, I would like to thank. Uh, last year I was part of this open group conference as a small core uh, scale in Hyderabad. But this time uh, uh, I can say that double thanks. Because we got the opportunity to meet uh, across the nation and uh, their case studies. It was a good learning for us. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, Hussi attended uh, all the government level things. We are doing a top to top approach. We heard the uh, buzzwords smart city, smart country, smart nation, smart world. But, I want to go in a part of the top approach. We want to make citizens smart. If citizen is a smart enough, the entire system is easy for us. Right now, uh, I am as a volunteer, I am doing a case study how we can make a citizen smart. One is empowerment and education. So as part of the empowerment, how the program architecture and government body is creating a scope to a citizen, for example, startups. What is the uh, scope you are creating uh, to become the startup uh, ready to be product? Because still we are having a challenge to bring a startup to the uh, industry. I have seen that from Sivanka representation, uh, the job and digital employment, the same we want in each country so that we like a startup companies immediately come into the market, they double and they create the employment in the world. Thank you. Uh, I'll try that. Uh, see, usually what you see, you saw the example of China, Steve was presenting. Typically, what happens is uh, in the government sector, even though the, the logical thinking is it should be top down, in reality, it never starts top down. What happens, even look at India, right? One state started India is actually middle up. So once states started it, now other states are showing interest. And I'm sure now there's a lot of traction even at the national level. So it is always like that. There are always segments or portions of the organization, enterprise, which are more forward thinking. In this case, it was a state. In China's case, there are three departments or ministries. It's always like that. Because the point here is there are certain parts of the organization. If you consider government as a single organization, who would like to be kind of at the forefront, uh, the trailblazer, so to speak, right? They want to do the enterprise architecture journey first. There are certain learnings from there. There's a case study, there's a success story. And then slowly, it kind of leaves into the rest of the organization and the rest of the enterprise. So it is possible that there are certain smart cities or cities who have been 
identified to be smart cities, we pick up this and say, okay, let's do it for one of the cities of the Depends on the leadership of the, uh, of the organization. And the other question you had was, to, what is this love? Yeah. We have to fuck. We need to have a two layer. Yes. We are building an enterprise architecture. It is not a one year job, it is a two year job. Then during the two years, then we are losing a, a two years around the city and they are going to the different school. Always we need to have to go the top down and bottom up approach in the same time so that till we build, we have citizens ready to use that. It is always like that. It is always like that. Yes. Top down primarily is happens because the decision, policy decisions have the fund flow. The, the, this going for enterprise architecture is, is a big policy decision that government of India should have one overarching enterprise architecture framework is a policy decision and would involve a lot of funding which will happen primarily at some apex level only, be it a state capital, it cannot happen at district level, right? But that does not stop solution rollout and handholding in the cities. And that goes on, so that's a primarily uh, also reference architecture, preparation. I, mean, I have my own opinion. Making a reference architecture at overarching India level is easier job than going for macro management in specifics. You can slowly, slowly drill down and make a state level and then or make it state level and then go district level or segmented vertical. So generally it begins, we we'll take the case of I, I, I don't want to take but federal enterprise fee. It, it was 50,000 view and 30,000 view and then come the specific. So overarching specific section becomes very easy to be taken on top level and slowly fund also flows, buying it happens and there is the administrative bill power also starts flowing. Then it reaches to the district level. Today, if any collector, district collector starts preparing enterprise architecture for district, probably in Andhra now it will be possible because they have reference architecture pradati to refer and uh, plug in back. Otherwise, it's very difficult. It's just, just difficult. And just to give you an example, I think it's probably the way to say because one of the things that we're doing as part of the work that GSAC was mentioning earlier, the national in EA, right? In the uh, the uh, apart from AP, the second case study that is coming out will be in the state of Odisha. But they are not going the entire state, they're choosing the health department. So it is always like that. There's always a priority. It is not never that you will go in for the entire enterprise because if you wait for the entire enterprise, in this case the entire national government, you will never go in. So we need to for Panchayati Raj. So always one segment, one particular part. Yeah. Overall, in India, it is very difficult. We know the amount of investment and efforts when we go, we go for rural local bodies at the Gram Panchayat level, at the village level, block level, district level, state level and country level. It is a massive and demands a lot of energy, passion, commitment and many times this does not come. Just because we had institutional support, National Informatics Center at three levels present, I could leverage my district level officer, state level and IC, and we would create. Similarly, in thinking about just because we are parallelly present at all levels, we could do it. Otherwise, it's very difficult. So I'm glad to know that Odisha is doing. Now, with many more. We did it in 2012. We need to be updating it. We did it in 2014. Now, Pragati has come in 15. And Odisha will come and many statements reference architecture, the game will be easier. And many more people would have. So the disease is spreading. <laughs> Just one thing on top uh, down, etc. All implementations, if you look at successful implementation, you have to exit ownership. Because exit ownership is not going to get success. So, uh, so it's always important to have a leader who's a visionary, who's on board. Right. So, and that's from one side, yeah. in, in a nation, the, the maturity, the level of maturity of society is different in the leadership. Right. So, when you do elect leaders, if you elect leaders of a certain caliber who are visionaries, then you are going to get visionary companies. <coughs> so, it's a two way street. But, exactly ownership is what in anything, private sector, government sector, 
I've seen it in both, no executive ownership. You may get a successful implementation, but your adoption is never good. So, that's important. I think, uh, coming back to that smart, uh, smart citizen, I think uh, from the enterprise uh, architecture perspective, it's all about intersecting uh, people, process, and technology. So, uh, when it comes to government sectors, then people is about uh, government employees working and citizens. So, as a part of that, uh, I think uh, we, the literacy initiative has to be very critical. We have the general literacy initiative plus the digital literacy initiative. So, we talk about smart government and then Digital literacy initiatives become a very critical uh, aspect of that uh, whole enterprise architecture. Thank you. Uh, why can't we collaborate with the startups? Because it is a five years plan for the government to bring into the citizen. Already there are startups who are coming with this small, small solution and they are going into the commercial. Oh, yeah. 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 They, they, they yeah. have capability yes. to send to the citizen until the solution is ready, they educate the citizen and bring it to the other level. Okay. So let me answer that. That, that. that was the point I was missing. So all the RFPs that are coming out as a result of e drug if, you, if you're online, you can actually see the RFPs. It's a public document. There is a clause which says that, for, so obviously uh, there is no single organization that can uh, respond to one RFP as a single entity. So the, the idea here is that it will be a consortium of respondents. 30% of the consortium value needs to be coming from companies who are SMEs located in the state of AP. Is that okay? Enough? That is to encourage the business, the local business. My other observation is, as Jay said, describing is the, 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 the ability provision of, of access to enable third parties and SMEs to build apps. Yes, like in absolutely. Privacy when it's there. Yes. So it's enabling small local business to absolutely. deliver services to citizens yes. based upon the information and services that the privacy requires. So I think I would like to hear so it's a really good uh, reinforcing model. So even if you have the biggies responding to the RFPs, they have to form a consortium which when 30% should come from SMEs located in India. I just want to take uh, a point of view from the private sector perspective because we heard a distinguished gentleman share the view from the public sector perspective. See, so in the private sector, we recognize there's a huge potential, not just in terms of corporate social responsibility, but in terms of business, in terms of profitability. Uh, in HDFC Life, we recently uh, launched a couple of products targeting at the rural and the micro segment. And our observation is that the customers in those sectors are more loyal are more credible. They have a higher level of persistency than the customers in the urban. And it was a blinding realization of the obvious. Secondly, we also realized that as corporates, uh, our understanding of that geography is fairly limited. And that's the reason why consortium is going to be the way forward. We have to partner with the local organizations who understand the sentiments, who understand the sensitivities, who understand what really matters in that part of the geography. So it is going to require a public or private partnership. But having said this, there's a huge potential that remains to be unraveled. So I'm, I'm going to start to somewhat cheekily ask a question of Steve, which I hope you're ready for. There was a comment, uh, I, I think it's uh, from about um, the people elect uh, leadership that's appropriate to the maturity of, of, of the you know, development of the people. So, uh, since you live in the States, <laughs> I listen, I yes. ask, my interpretation, what I heard from that is, here is India's chance to overtake America. <laughs> well, that's a, you know, it doesn't, yes. 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 Uh, yeah, I'm not taking responsibility for the US, <laughs> the US electorate. I, I have to live there, but I don't have to uh, accept responsibility. <laughs> So we have next question. Uh, what is the current state of India EA as IMP EA? How Open Group as an organization is going to be enabled in that? <coughs> so, uh, so the current development of India is uh, on. Okay, I would say it is still about 40 percent done, and uh, there are two people from Open Group, like James and Abraham, you know, are participating there. So there is a contribution from Open Group. Uh, in fact, they invited. 
time and uh, really insert in international best practices. So that was part of the overall uh, plan, so to speak. We expect the first version, so what we are developing there is a reference uh, architecture for state governments. So our unit of analysis there is the state governments. Uh, so that the state governments can take that reference architecture and immediately start an RFP process, procurement process. We are also attempting to develop a methodology because one of the things that the state governments, and I've seen it in other countries also, is that you can have a reference architecture, give it to the governments, and then they will say, okay, what do we do with this? If those beautiful pictures and all of that stuff, but where is the guidance, right? So that's the reason why we are also attempting to develop a methodology, a step by step methodology, which is derived from the and in fact, if you, were, if you remember what I said, was saying, it's a lighter version of EDM, so that we want to take only the relevant uh, aspects of it. And to show the example of how the methodology works in practice, we have one case study which is e-Pravati, most obvious. The next one is the Odisha one. That's the reason why Odisha has been chosen as a partner state okay, for this. So we expect something to be out by the month of April, but that's the official deadline. I'm expected for a month or two or two or three years, so we are looking at something like a year or two. So, not, not directly relevant to that question, but um, to do with the, the role of the Open Group and the government and, um, in general, uh, government EA initiatives. Um, what we're finding here, so, I, mean, I, I think I, I was trying to convey that what we learned about China was largely, largely a surprise that we stumbled over, that uh, accidentally got the information and then followed up. And that's, that has actually been the case in some other countries too. Um, and at this point, we have um, really quite a long list of uh, governments uh, either adopting TOGAF-based enterprise architecture activities um, at a whole government level or um, some subset of government, whether it's individual ministries or collections of ministries. And um, one of the, uh, I'll give a specific example of, uh, with, with, we have a, a, an activity underway to kind of gather that common learning all together and try and package it up in some way that would be useful for, to share with, um, with other governments or to share with the governments that have contributed to it and so it's all about to share learning. Um, one specific example is the government in Brazil which is now starting to uh, come out of some of its recent recent troubles um, and the economy is at least looking at the, um, uh, not declining this year. Um, so that the government is very keen, they look at the size of their country they look at uh, the number of people in the country and they look at their relative positioning in terms of the United Nations um, survey or, or just the, the whole concept of enterprise architecture and uh, they consider themselves very, very immature and very much at the beginning level. And they've specifically asked us to help introduce them to other uh, governments in other countries and see how they can not learn all the same lessons the hard way, but you know, deep fog over uh, some of the pitfalls that there are along the way and the lessons learned along the way. And we do actually have a plan to, uh, for a gathering of uh, um, uh, various government representatives at our July conference in Canada. Uh, so that's still in the, in the planning stages, but what we're seeing is, is a lot of commonality, but some um, uh, both, both across, you know, right across the experiences that we've learned about, but also some specific commonality in subsets. And uh, with a bit more analysis and a bit more help from, um, from those contributing um, the information in the first place, we should be able to get to uh, a bit of a clearer picture that would uh, hopefully uh, help uh, add many, many more countries to the list that might, might come and talk about their case studies at an event such as, like, like, such as this in the future. When, when um, we were doing some of the preparation work for this conference, I uh, was visiting some countries, including uh, uh, Sri Lanka, which is like uh, uh, Peter was here. Um, but I also visited um, Kenya and Ethiopia to discover they're both using TOGA government projects. I was informed when I was there, so it was Rwanda and Tanzania. Um, 
uh, had an interesting conversation in, in Bahrain uh, at the weekend. They were unfortunately not able to make it here to talk to you. But they have been working on a whole government enterprise architecture framework for many yeah, years. Yeah, but sure. but he is Very mature. Very mature, but, but they, they were saying that the uptake and implementation and usage across the government departments had been much less than they had hoped for until the price of oil dropped. And suddenly everyone's become interested because their budgets are sweet, so they can no longer afford to do their own thing. So they started to, they, they were coming in pound round to the idea of let's use shared services. So things are changing, which is very interesting. Yeah, it, we've got a, a long journey to go. One of the things I was discovering um, in, in you know, Ethiopia as an example, and also happening in several other countries, um, World Bank and World Health Organizations, when they found projects <coughs> say, oh, um, you need to use enterprise architecture. That just, that's part of the condition of the money these days. So, um, Steve, I don't know, I don't know how to ask the question. But I would. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know uh, from your experience across the globe, what percentage of the countries all segments who created the enterprise architecture and never went for the implementation. Because I am afraid in government, Odisha will do it and once the disease is spread, it will be done as a part of fashion, but business value will not be there because implementation will be either after it or will not be done. So it will be another Bible, Quran, Gita and plus enterprise architecture of state government. So what is the international experience? Uh, I, mean, I, I, was, I was about to say um, one of the things I said about the reason we were having the awards here this time is there really is some, some amazing work going on uh, compared to anything else we've seen in governments in this, as you say, this part of the world, in true American style. Um, but in India in, in particular, you know, start, starting as, as part of described with, uh, with AP, but but uh, now spreading out. Um, before then, the example I would have given that has uh, that I surprised me initially uh, when I first came across it as a level of maturity was South Africa. Um, they had a government-wide enterprise architecture for probably at least a decade, if not longer now, um, and uh, really, really embracing. Enterprise architecture very early on, um, and uh, it was mandated uh, from top down, and it, 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 it filtered out. Um, now they uh, they still have it, but um, uh, administrations have changed, and we've heard several times how that can impact things. Um, but it's still there. Um, but uh, I'm due to visit there soon to, uh, to find out a bit more about the recent activity and. And to a point that's been raised a couple of times, how they are actually going about maintaining it once once they have it, and they're fairly mature. How do they how do they actually uh, maintain it? What systems do they have in place to do that? What's the cost of doing that? And um, and are they doing it? Uh, so South Africa would be one example. Um, uh, in the UK, it's very much um, department by department. There isn't a, a government wide. Um, activity at the moment. Yeah, very, very much so. Um, there are, for example, the uh, Department of Works and Pensions, is, which is the biggest uh, government department, I think, in the UK. Um, they have been using enterprise architecture uh, for some time. They, um, they have been customers of several of the training organisations in our uh, Togo ecosystem for some time. Uh, slightly scarily, the um, the Ministry of, of uh, Justice in the UK is also using uh, uh, using enterprise architecture, um, uh, but it, it is very much hit and miss, and it and it somewhat depends upon one or two champions and where they might move during their careers just to, just to get there. So that, that's quite different. Um, and in the US, it's uh, it was, Possible to predict where that's going. Um, it's, it's, in, in the US, it's um, mandated. Sure. It's been a co-enacted mandated. But if we're not knowledge, is that a 
successful strategy has it actually achieved the results of producing effective IT that implements effective architectures, or is it a constant? Yeah, I don't know. Assignment. They become consulting market. A very greener pasture for the due respect to. And we have had ASSDG, NSDG, many, I can quote many. Where theoretical work was done, documents were prepared, and some, some artifacts were never brought value to the table. So, while this the disease is spreading, I wanted to have international experience that does it happen in other countries also, or is it only specific to Asia? Human beings are the same everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. To answer your, to answer your question, I'm not convinced that it's much more than uh, it's been a, a, a license to uh, print money for some of the consultancies to come and say, here's how you get one. I've actually heard stories of uh, uh, people saying, uh, we want to you know, we know we have to have enterprise architecture, you know, we want to buy one, how much would it cost? And, and uh, that type of thing. But so there well, is like getting on with my project. Yes, that's right. Yeah, well yeah. But it is to uh, to use your term somewhat of a box filling exercise. But um, uh, there is a there is some legislation I've heard about I, I haven't had the opportunity to investigate since I've heard about it, which um, will mandate that each state in the United States has uh, its, has an enterprise architecture and that the chief architect or whatever the equivalent position is, um, I don't know whether they have to appoint a chief architect or there's the closest equivalent is allowed, um, is actually responsible for um, having one and uh, the, the uh, funds from the federal government are uh, affected if they if they aren't up to shape. How they measure the quality of it, how they measure it in place, I don't yet know, but it, it came up last week at a conference in San Francisco, so I'll dig into that a bit more. So uh, earlier the gentleman from Sri Lanka, I think he has left, he was yes. an example uh, of South Korea and Singapore. Mm -hmm. I've lived in both in Singapore for multiple years, more than a decade. So Singapore, it is a journey. It starts, of course, Singapore is a very small place, you cannot compare it to the state or just a city. But they started in 1999 and they continue. So that is very important. That sustaining that interest in buying is very important. You can always argue that they have a different model of governance and you know all that stuff is, is always you have those reasons, but that's one of the reasons why they have yeah, succeeded. You know, they, 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 they cannot, I mean, a country like India need to be learning more from China kind of the Canadian economy. So the, the kind of governance may be politically different. But the challenges are most of the time similar yes. in adoption and sustaining the technology. Singapore, South Korea, and yes. Very good ecosystem of players, and we were just talking about startups coming and participating and creating value. I met the mayor of uh, you know, the state of Hawaii and understood from his experience how, after opening up the data, that he had collected from the perspective of the traffic, the vehicle registration, the weather conditions, and what have you, the citizens came forward and started delivering value. And that's one critical step the government can take in terms of building that. And there are tons of examples even within India which are emerging right now. Just a couple of days, I was reading Economic Times, and there was mention of uh, a company which had developed the app, uh, which was more like a social for the farmers, social app for the farmers. And we are talking about facts over here where uh, you know, the literacy level is very low. And the, all the farmer had to do is take a snap of his crop and seek guidance in terms of why the yield is so low. We are talking about communication by virtue of images. And this mobile app connected this farmer in a very crowdsourcing way to somebody who could just say that, hey, it seems like there are some worms which have developed in the roots of your plant. And that's the value of exposing the data and then getting the contribution from the wider ecosystem. Have, have some more questions. Yeah. Yes. questions. Yes. Uh, I have one question from NIC. Uh, is there any forum where best practices or case studies on EA done by other nations across the world are postings for learning? If not, can Open Group make an effort to bring out by making a close group of chosen enterprise architects across the world? That's one of the Well, I think I think that's the 
that's really what I was what I was saying a few minutes ago. Is we're clear we've got activity uh, going inside, actually at the moment inside the open group star to say, okay, what what have we learned? Um, the experiences from India and, and China and Brazil and South Africa and the UK. What what have we learned? Um, what what is consistent? What seems to have um, have been effective and, and what's been less effective and, and package that up and be able to share uh, what those best practices are and then hopefully also be able to um, say okay well that's that's the government uh, situation what parts of this are applicable to the private sector uh, as well which would be obviously of great interest to um, a bigger part of the open group membership so um, work in progress, I guess, is the answer to, answer to that, but, but actively in progress, there's, there's a lot there. I'll just add a you know, statement there. You know, it's always good to look for case studies, but I'm expecting some of you to become case studies. Why are you waiting for case studies? Yeah. Become the examples. That's good. Like in the Gathi, we will That's the reason why we had six, seven case studies here. Another question? Yeah. Uh, I have my question uh, like this two days and uh, this conference experience. Uh, off the line, I was talking with uh, Chief Steve uh, regarding the it more sections which open source is introducing utilities sector as well as uh, petrochemical progress. So uh, I would love to see those progresses that will take the timeline when they will come up with the new version. Because we as, as an architect uh, work with the uh, heterogeneous companies, not only government. Government is one of the enterprise of enterprise. Okay, uh, I will link my discussion with the previous question from the distinguished panel also that EA, we de develop the framework, we develop the domain artifacts, uh, we guide the uh, delivery team, we guide the PMO, we guide uh, the whole organization. EA is specifically linked with the CHO, CIO, CTO, CFO. So it depends upon the chief. If he is more EA oriented, he is running in private space, not government I am talking. And I was also having in the beginning of the day, why this is going for a bottom up approach, why not top down approach as my colleague asked. So government can take initiative, but as a government like the federal structure in India, which is very difficult. I think I think Pala will uh, knowing the experience of the equal rating. And second question is with the uh, uh, open group, like uh, eight of, of, of the phases of our ADM model. So the real uh, phases which are which are implementation governance and architecture change management. So I was working with one of our client uh, for uh, implementation governance. So I found that stuff should be more less than I referred some more case studies, the more materials. So I, I would like to request in the next version of token, just try to take some feedbacks from our uh, forum. So that we can we can refer the TOGAP as one of the best framework because clients are always are poor by TOGAP. Well, yeah, thank you. On that on that point, um, the uh, that is that is exactly the direction that the architect forum is moving in uh, right now is to is to say. Um, we have to be we have to be very very careful with TOGAF. It's so widely used in you know yes it's tailored but effectively it's so widely used we can't do anything in the next version that that um, disenfranchises that huge uh, number of organisations and individuals who are using it. But the direction that they are taking for the next version is um, to say is to is to look at it and say well. There's probably a core toga that is applicable just about anywhere, um, and, but what the uh, what the desire is and what the the stated need from the marketplace is is exactly what you say. It's implementation guidance. It's how do I do this? Um, where has this worked? And are there specific industry examples here? So to build a collection of um, uh, of, of case studies, uh, guides, and other things that will be part of TOGAF. They won't be part of the core normative standard as such, but they'll be part of 
um, the, the overall work that is that is TOGA. So that is the direction that they're going in. And um, as I said yesterday when I uh, when I opened uh, the forum produced I think of, uh, I think one a month last year they published um, white papers and guides uh, along those along those lines. Um, and it's not just about TOGA. It's it's um, you know, it's how, the other thing we get asked is how can we more clearly tie together how open group standards should be used, could be used together. Uh, Archimate being an obvious example with TOGA, but also IT for IT, um, open fair. Now, I think in your packs there was a white paper on some of, uh, how you might use some of the standards in a, in a um, business transformation. Um, and I think for me that what I would like to do, um, as it was described to me, uh, the need is customers go on a journey during their transformation and they have decision points along the way and they have to make those decision points. And it would be really helpful to know which standards they should be considering and which might be useful to them and can save them some, some pain uh, at which point in their journey. And that's that's the kind of thing that we need to do with with the members. We can't do it ourselves at the start, but with the members, um, uh, particularly on the consultancy side, um, where, where, uh, where are those standards used at what point in time and how do they work together? And, and, and ideally, how do they map to other standards too? Because we, we don't pretend that we're the only standards organization in the world. Um, uh, and we, we try not to have standards that are in conflict with, with others. It's more about how they play together. So uh, that is the direction we're taking now. So on, on that note, I'm yeah. glad we have to be out of the room. So small, the small, a small observation to, to the previous yes. question. Previous question where the idea was that can open group publish a best practices. I think we are also sponsoring or supporting the journal of uh, enterprise architecture. If, if this, these case studies or summary of case studies which are uh, uh, awarded here in a way directly or indirectly can be published yes. and people can be uh, requested to subscribe uh, journal, probably it will be, you can consider that. Yeah. So that's a, that's a content of the AEA journal. JEA, yes. of Enterprise Architecture, yeah. supported, is it supported by the Open Group? Well, it's published by the Association of Enterprise Architects, but it's supported by the Open Group. Open Group. So if we could take our case that wherever globally you award somebody, a substance at least one pace yeah. or two pace yeah. can be given. Yeah. 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 That will that will increase the value of our forum. So thank you to our panel very much indeed.